My name is Nick Amaron. I'm Director of Support Engineering at Automox. A couple of things, full transparency, my laptop's been having a lot of issues today, so we might get a little interesting in this session. Also, I've been giving demos the past two days, so I've gotten in the habit of talking really fast. If I'm going too fast, just throw something at me. I'll slow down. Um, but yeah, sure. There we go. <laughs> yeah, let me go do that real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, how's that sound? Much better. Cool. So today we're going to talk about Gia. Show of hands. Who's actually used Gia or heard of Gia before? Anyone? Awesome. Keep me honest. If you guys see anything I say is wrong up here, I'm not perfect. So uh, just let me know. I'll uh, go ahead and get that fixed in the PowerPoint before we... Uh, open up access to the GitHub. Speaking of the GitHub, if you guys want to see anything during this presentation or the script that we're going to use later today, we're going to go over, not line by line, but for the most part, on how we set up the configurations. That's the link right there. Leave that up for a second. A few more people taking some quick pictures real quick. All right. If anybody needs this at the end, I'll throw it up again. So what is Gia? That's Microsoft's definition, but ultimately Gia is a tool in PowerShell that allows you to constrain access for any of your users uh, to be able to do certain things. Pretty granularly, actually. With Gia, you can, oh, it's going up there and there, but not mine. Limit which command lists administrators can use, limit which parameters those on those command lists administrators can use, you even go as far as saying which values those administrators can add to those commandlets. And also define what security com context those commands are executed in. So let's say you have a bunch of admins. They don't necessarily have access to do any of this stuff, but you want them to be able to do certain things like clear DNS cache or something without adding them to the domain admin group. You can define a service account in that um, configuration that will execute in that context. That way you don't have to go out throwing admin rights everywhere. GL also helps to reduce presence of overprivileged accounts. And you can do a lot of logging with it. it. Generates transcripts on what's going on in each session as they're added, which means you can go and see what admins are doing. That's useful for a couple things. One, if you want to get more restrictive, you get to see what exactly they're do is using and what they're not using. And then you just start adding more and more restrictions to your different configuration profiles. Why is it useful? So let's imagine you have that DNS admin I talked about. Generally, you would need to add them to the domain admins group. That gives them access to do a lot of things. Full rights to Active Directory, scary. They can browse file systems and execute a lot of scripts that you may not want them to actually executing. What if I could limit those DNS admins to only be able to clear the DNS cache or restart the server? That's really limiting. I'm sure they need to do more, but for the spirit of this demo, we're just going to do those two things, right? Or what if I could do that without actually giving them local admin rights to the domain controller or anything else that they need access to? That's what GIA allows you to do. What are the prerequisites on client machines? Windows 7, 8, or 8.1. Windows 10, 15, 11, or higher. For server, 2008 or 2 or higher. Um, you do need Windows Management Framework 5 or higher. That translates to essentially PowerShell 5 or higher. PowerShell remoting has to be enabled in your environment. Otherwise, people can't connect to the different endpoints, different GIA endpoints, um, in order to access those sessions. Side note, all this is documented by Microsoft. When I was doing this slide, I realized that they changed a lot of their documentation, and Google hadn't caught up. So that's the old link. That's the new link where Microsoft has everything. So what defines access? There's two pieces to GIA. Um, one is role capabilities. This is where you define your access for the different files or different roles. So let's say, for example, you have a DNS admin role. You say they can do X, Y, and Z. Help desk tech role, they can do A, B, and C. All that's defined within the role compatibilities files. This is where you define the commandlets, the parameters, all that stuff. Those files are generally PowerShell fires, files with the PSRC extension. Session configurations is the other side of that. So you define who can use the GIA endpoint that you're configuring and the roles that you're configuring. 
These are PowerShell files with PSSC extensions. Uh, you define what roles any given user has access to. They can have access to multiple roles. So you have your DNS admin, your help desk admin. Now let's say you have a full admin that you want to have access to both of those roles. All that is defined in that session configuration file. And then ultimately that's where you also define your execution context as well. Both of these files is what drives access. That's what defines what any user can do at any given point in time when you're connecting to a G endpoint. Execution context is the other thing. There's two ways that you can define access. I mentioned the context, right? Virtual accounts is one. With virtual accounts, they're temporary accounts that are generated with every session that you connect to. Those virtual accounts on normal endpoints pretty much are added to the local admins group. If you're on a domain controller, it adds it to the domain admins group and they have all those permissions. Temporary accounts, once that session's over, they get deleted. They're unique to each user and they only last the duration, of, the duration of the PowerShell session. As mentioned, local machine, admins group, domain controllers, domain admins. They can be configured to use different groups in your session configurations. So let's say you want them to just be part of the network operator group instead of domain admins, all that's configurable. The other option is to use a group managed service account, useful in anything you need your GA users to do, with like network resources, right? Domain controller is the exception there. Obviously, if they're part of the domain admins group, they can do anything. But if you're on a local machine, you want to define a group managed user account that has access to, I don't know, some share on your drive or, or on your environment. That's where you would use a group managed service account. And you would basically use a service account that has access to those particular network resources. Gives you a domain identity that you can use to authenticate with anything else. Uh, and obviously that's only available on domain join machines. A few other noteworthy configurations for what you can do with GIA. Session transcripts, I mentioned that. You can define a folder where all the transcripts of your connection are generated. It tells you exactly what admins are doing as they're connecting to your sessions. Recommend using that honestly. Worst case scenario, you can look at those and see how you can restrict your sessions even more in the future. Best case, or that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, someone does something malicious and you have a record of it. Generally has info about the connecting user, the assigned run as identity, and commands executed in that session, and they're stored in wherever you configure it to be stored. User drives is another option. Let's say, for example, you have users that are connecting to your GIA endpoint. You need them to be able to move files to and from the endpoint and only have access to those files. That's what user drivers lets you do. Useful when you need to copy those files. And it creates a PS drive map to a unique folder on your endpoint. It persists across sessions. So let's say they disconnect, they connect again, they'll have any files that they saved there last time. You can also configure a max size on that if you don't want them to store gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs. Set that to, I don't know, 300 megs. It's reasonable for scripts and things of that nature. Conditional access rules are cool. Um, I actually learned about this as I was putting this presentation together. Gia recently went, a, went over kind of a reformatting of sorts. Um, conditional access rules pretty much facilitate the concept of something called just-in-time administration. So let's say, for example, you have a help desk tech. An issue comes in with a particular system. And you know in order to troubleshoot that, they need access that they normally don't have. What you can do with just-in-time administration is ticket comes in, it gets assigned to a user, that user gets added to a group, a security group of some sort, let's call it GIA enabled. That allows them to connect to your GIA endpoint and grants them access to do everything you want them to do that you've configured. Once they're done, that ticket gets closed, they get removed from that group. No incident, they can't connect to the GIA endpoint, they don't have the rights. Just-in-time administration, they only have the rights when they need it, that's it. So now we're going to get to the part that's going to be interesting. <laughs> this is where I've been having issues with my laptop today. But ultimately here what I have is a Windows Server 2016 VM. I have this script. This is what you'll see on the GitHub. Don't run this in production. <laughs> this creates some user accounts, creates an OU. Oh, great. <laughs> Hold on. I 
There we go. <laughs> there is a script for that. <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right, so as I was saying, don't run this in production. This will create an OU, create a bunch of other AD objects, throw it in that OU that we're going to use for this demo. Um, I'm pretty sure I noted that in the comments somewhere, but in case I didn't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> so what we're doing here, pretty straightforward, creating a no, new OU, GIA demo. I didn't want to like muddle up any environments or anything, even with test environments, you want to try to keep things separate, right? In that OU, we're going to first create a few different groups, DNS admins, help desk technicians, and a GIA enabled group. The DNS admins are going to keep the roles that or the users that we're going to assign the roles of DNS admins to, vice versa, respectively for help desk technicians. And that GIA enabled group is what we use for that just in time administration I was talking about earlier. Create a few of those respective users, adding some those users to the groups that you've created and pretty much just confirming that all that's been done with a write host. Uh, this init directory function just creates a few directories if they don't exist. Um, I'm pretty heavy on using functions in PowerShell. I think they're easier to maintain, easier to read, easier to document. Um, here comes uh, an interesting part, the generate geo files. This is what's actually going to generate those files um, that I was mentioning. So those files are the role capability files and the session configuration files. So first we're going to start with the DNS role. Defining a few parameters, um, path of where you want the file stored, author, company name, all that good stuff, description of the role. Start to get to some really interesting parts. Uh, modules to import. So you can import active modules for the help desk role. We want to give them the ability to um, reset passwords, right? And in that one, you'll see down here, we actually imported the Active Directory module. Uh, for the DNS role, we didn't need Active Directory module, but we just gave it Microsoft.PowerShell.Core, which is some base PowerShell commandlets just for the purpose of this demo. Here's where it gets really interesting. You start defining specific commandlets that they can see. Uh, now, if you've imported modules, it's going to throw all of those module commandlets in there. But these visible commandlets are ones that will add that may or may not be part of that module. And here you can define a lot of granular information. One, this one on top here, just says get hyphen asterisk. What that means is I'm actually going to get any commandlet that starts with the word get and I'm going to throw it into this session so that when users can connect to it, they can get access to all of that stuff. I'm not too worried about people reading information at this point. I just don't want them to be able to actually do stuff, right? What I do want them to do, though, is restart services uh, and restart the computer. Now, the services I'd want them to restart aren't all the services on the machine. This is a DNS admin. Ultimately, I just want them to, restart, want them to be able to restart the DNS server and DNS cache service. That's it. Anything else they try to type in there, it's going to throw back an error, say access is denied. Um, really cool stuff. Obviously, you don't want them to restart like IIS or anything else that you may need on there. Uh, restart computer, same thing, validate set, local host or dot, so they can't do like a remote restart of another server. Um, and then visible external commandlets. So external commandlets is the other one, things like IP config, whatever you may want them to do. Highly recommend to keep as much as possible inside PowerShell. PowerShell generally has equivalent commands, commandlets for external commands that are out there. Um, but just as an example, I just threw, threw whoami.exe up there. Once that's done, you basically just do new PS role compatibility file, splat out everything you did in the, uh, in the parameters up above, and that's going to go ahead and create that file. We can do the same thing for the help desk role parameters. We can define a few other things. As I mentioned, I do want it to have set AD account password. We've also imported Active Directory. For those passwords, a few things. The, the naming convention I use for my users is U hyphen, so for user, and then A for admin, which means they have full rights. A lot of environments do that, where they try to separate user accounts from admin accounts. I don't necessarily want my help desk users to have access to reset a password for an admin account. 
because if they're being malicious at that point, they can reset the password, log in, all of a sudden they have full right to do whatever they want. So in this particular case, I have just basically validated that they can only provide U hyphen asterisk accounts. No worries about admin rights. Visible external commandlets, who am I again? Alias definitions. So I don't want them to necessarily, when they reset the password, hard code that or put that in the transcript, right? So ultimately, what this does is allow them to just say, get password, I define that alias, and all that does is prompt right there for a password. Uh, you can do whatever you want as an alias and give any snippet of code in there and it's gonna just execute that when that user just types in get password. Create that role compatibility file again. Now, where it gets really interesting is with those role compatibilities, they have to be part of a module in a location where, so for example, if I do env, Oh, I misspelled that. Who knew it was harder to type in front of like 50 people? <laughs> so basically in one of those locations, you can add a new location in there if you want and just keep your modules in there, but I just threw it, had it copy into one of the existing module locations. And then you get into your session configuration files. This is where you define what groups or, or sorry, where you define what users have access to what role capabilities within GIA. So you'll see here I've defined lab DNS admins, lab help desk desk, techs, and lab domain admins, and I've assigned the respective roles to them. DNS admins get DNS admin, vice versa, you know, respectively for help desk, but domain admins get both. So when they sign into the session, they see everything from both of the role configurations that I've defined above. The end of this, all I do here is call all the functions from above in this last one. So set up Gia demo, sign a few paths where I want to store all of this stuff, init those directories where I want them to store, create the demo AD objects, generate the Gia files, and then just run that. So let's go ahead and run this real quick and see what it looks like. Should take a second. Awesome, so all that's set up now. What I have here, if we go to my C drive, I've generated this entire folder here. And in there you'll see the GIA module with the PSM1 and PSD manifests. The role capabilities are where it gets interesting. These are what, this is what it actually looks like in a text file. Now, you can modify this directly or you can use the commandlets. It's really up to you. Command lets just make it a little easier in terms of keeping the syntax. When you're modifying it directly, it's really easy to miss something, um, you know, like a squiggly line or a comma or whatever. As you can see, it's not very legible here when, when you start defining that. And you can imagine when you start defining a lot of access, this just gets longer and longer and longer and longer, really hard to maintain. Um, but that's one of the challenges that GIA is maintaining and defining your roles, right? So you can see here, there's a lot more we can do that's been actually commented out. If we scroll down, you can define providers, you can define access to scripts, uh, alias definitions. So if you don't want them to use aliases at all, you can definitely just restrict access to all, access to all of that. Um, just a lot of stuff overall. To be honest, I haven't used all of this stuff, so I'm not sure what that looks like. The main stuff that I've used is the what's kind of going on in the demo today. Um, but there's just a lot of experimentation you can do with GIA and a lot of a lot of access. Now, one thing to be careful of, like I said, GIA recently did kind of go reformatting of sorts. A lot of the documentation out there is basically for like the old way of doing GIA, which is actually what I'm used to. So this was kind of a surprise when I started putting this presentation together. Um, so just make sure that when you're looking at something or looking any resources up, that if you run into issues, make sure it's the you know date published or whatever is, I think newer than a year ago or something, or newer than the date of the, the new Microsoft documents that recently came out. Let's go ahead and look at the session configuration files. So we're gonna come back here.
And here you can see where I've defined which groups have access to which roles. That's all right there on the bottom. Run as virtual account is that virtual account context that I was referring to. There's another one here that you'll see when you do run as managed service account that looks like that, and you actually define that managed service account. So it would be whatever your domain is, so lab in our case, slash the name of that service account. And then whatever access that service account has is whatever access G is going to have or anybody connecting to the GIA endpoint has. Um, you see here I've also defined the GIA transcripts. Apparently I, I added an extra slash at some point somewhere. Um, so that's not great. So we'll go ahead and fix that real quick. Um, and then you'll see that each session configuration has its own unique GUID as well. Those get auto-generated. You can define that if you'd like, but it's not really necessary. Now that we have these, what you have to do is configure them, right? So if you do get PS, that's right, session config, sorry. Configuration. So those are the default ones that pretty much come on any operating system. Um, one thing I want to touch point on here is GIA does not protect against admins. If you're an admin, you're not restricted in what session you can connect to, which means you can just connect to the default PowerShell session and bypass everything you've configured with GIA. So if you want to use GIA, just make sure that you're restricting users that don't have admin rights, because ultimately it's not going to do anything for you if they have full admin rights. Um, to register a new session, you just or a new PS configuration, you just do register PS session configuration. Give it a name. I'm going to call it Gia Demo and path. I put it in C Gia session configurations. demo.psse. You get a warning about sometimes having to restart WinRM. If you wanted to make changes to your GIA session and apply that session again, it's not real time. What you have to do is unregister that session, and you basically what that just looks like is unregister GIA session. No, sorry, unregister PS configuration session. <laughs> Session configuration. Give it the name. And that's it. So if you then go and look at the sessions again, that's not there. So then you just run that command again once with your changes for registering it. And this is where you would want to restart your WinRM service. Otherwise, the changes may not apply. Um, so you just do restart service. Win RM. Cool. So let's just make sure our session is there. You'll see Gia demo right there on the top. So let's see what it looks like when we connect to it. So we'll do a quick get command to see what we have access to. Remember, I'm connecting as a full admin now, so I'll have access to both the DNS role and the help desk role. Not much I can do on here. A lot of get commands, set AD account passwords, that help desk one that I'm getting there. DNS doesn't have access to that, but since it's just collating all of it, right? Um, to give you an idea of, kind of put this a little bit more in context, right? So let's get out of here and do a get command regularly. It's going to keep going. There's a lot, generally. Um, looks like it. Yeah, well, computer's being weird. But you get the point. There's a lot you can do in PowerShell. Using Geo, you can really restrict that to 
pretty much your own imagination, right? Whatever roles you have in your environment that you want to define, you can do all that in Jia and make sure that they can only do exactly what they need to do and nothing more. Um, let's go back to the presentation real quick. There's a couple more slides. Cool. Everybody can see it. Yes. So some miscellaneous info. Um, mentioned some of this already. Challenges on Jia does not protect against full admins. Defining exactly what each role needs is a very cumbersome process. Take some time. You're not going to get it right the first time. At some point, you're going to have this all defined. Users are going to go use it, and they're going to be like, oh, crap, well, I need to do this too, and I don't have access to it. And then you've got to go and react to that pretty quickly to make sure that they don't continue to be disadvantaged in whatever it is that they need to do. Um, PowerShell proficiency is required. Uh, for administrating GIA, it's a very accurate statement. Now, let's say, for example, your help desk text, they don't use PowerShell, they've never used it before. Um, I would argue giving them access to do one commandlet and teaching them one commandlet is easier than giving them access to 80 users and computers. Um, I personally don't trust a lot of people. You just being in that interface, or even if they don't have access, but that's just me being paranoid. I'd rather just give them one command line that they could paste and change some stuff and use it. And you know, at the end of the day, that starts helping up-level your help desk technicians to be able to use that more as well. So it's kind of a win-win. Um, they may get interested in learning PowerShell more, learn to do a lot more things, and then move up in the organization. Who knows? Deployment of this can be done either through DSC, desired state configuration, or through configuration management tool of your choice. All you would do is just send that payload down, do that register, you know, register PS session configuration command. That's pretty much it. And that's it. I think I'm pretty early, but do you guys have any questions? Nope. I do actually. Uh, so we're not we're not doing a whole lot of PowerShell yet. Sure. Mm -hmm. does, does, will this take effect with any of that, or is it it's only purely with a, a PowerShell or a PowerShell session? Sure. So the question was, will this uh, affect anything outside of PowerShell, uh, particularly any UI components of what Microsoft's adding into their respective OSs or anything? The answer is no, it won't. This is solely PowerShell. Um, it won't affect access anywhere else. Yeah, let me let me go back to that slide so people have it. Too far. Perfect. There you go. You guys should have access to that now. I think I opened it up right before this session, so public access there. Any other questions? Did you get this to apply to like your help desk? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's. Um, it's not necessarily how Geo works. However, you could do something like that with the uh, profile scripts that run whenever you start Geo. Set some configurations there. One of the ways I've seen it used most effectively, though, is with PowerShell Web Access. Is anyone familiar with PowerShell Web Access? A little bit. Um, so ultimately, you just put that on a jump box, right? Uh, and just host it on there with IIS. People just connect to that through over a web browser and whatnot, and they just sign in. They would have to define the session they're in, but I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Once you do that, then they just get on there and do what they need to do. It makes it a little bit easier from a deployment perspective because you don't have to deploy it to every endpoint. You just have it in one central location. It makes that easier to administrate because if you have to make changes to it, you only have to change it in those key locations as opposed to deploying it out to your entire environment as well. Yeah, they get everything that's in that module. So, but with Active Directory, if you didn't say just set password, they can change the password. Yep. Um, I did have a question. Uh, Jay, it sounds really cool. I like that idea that we can build tools for other administrators that don't need full access. Do you know if anyone, is there community or any other type of 
uh, organizations that's building a wrapper around this so that we can more take the build uh, for JEA and then make it more of a GUI for the new, uh, newer administrator who's going to be responsible for that? Sure. Uh, I, I don't think there's any GUI-based tools out there. Um, there is some that are a script similar to mine, but way, way better, uh, written by the guys at um, PowerShell.org, I believe. Uh, Helmick is his last name. I forget what his first name is. Jason Helmick, yes. He wrote one. He's got a few of these uh, presentations out there for GIA, and he's got a really good one that he uses when he talks in those presentations. Highly recommend looking up his sessions as well. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, he's definitely got a lot of good stuff around that. He knows it way more than I do, so believe him over me. <laughs> yep. Anything else? I think we're all set. All right, well. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask them. I mean, I'll be here up, up here for a little bit more. If you guys have any questions, feel free to come up. Um, otherwise, everything's on that GitHub. Uh, and let me know. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.